Okay. Good morning and welcome to the study of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. I'll be your pastor this morning. My name is Phil McMillan and uh, the first thing we need to do before we open the Word of God and start our study this morning in 1 Timothy, we need to pray. Let's bow our heads and ask for the eyes and ears of the Spirit that we might see what the Lord has for us in His Word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious blessing of, of freedom to come and assemble together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this magnificent book you preserved through the ages that we might uh, know the mind of Christ and we, we might have encouragement in each and every day from, from the words that you've given us. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the eyes of your spirit that we might see what you would have us know in your word. Let uh, let us not rest on any wisdom of man, but on the ears, eyes and ears of God as we look to the word in Timothy this morning and be encouraged and blessed by them. And we ask it in Christ's name, sir. Amen. Amen. Okay, we, we had some technical difficulties this morning. We okay? Are you still working on it? Still working on it. Okay. Well, uh, you may have trouble later on if you're going to try to listen to this online, huh? Yeah. But uh, you can, you can uh, I think we're going out strong here on the Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we've been uh, working our way through the uh, uh, first epistle of Paul to Timothy, and uh, uh, we've had uh, introduction and started, uh, 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 did an outline of the entire book, and then we come back and we're working our way through First Timothy chapter 1, and uh, we got down to about verse 12 last, uh, last week. And uh, actually, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about what we covered last week in our second class today. But this morning, we're going to just pick up where we left off. And uh, we have gotten down to, uh, we saw uh, Paul said howdy in the first couple of uh, verses. And then he immediately started addressing the needs that he's writing the epistle for, and that's to combat um, uh, false doctrines that have arisen in Ephesus at the church that young Timothy is pastoring. And uh, uh, one of those we saw was uh, uh, Gnosticism. And uh, you think, well, what do I need to know about Gnosticism for? Gnosticism, it's a silly word, and we don't have to worry about that today. Well, we do. We see it all the time, even still today, because Gnosticism is is coming from the Greek word kenosis, gnosis, right? Uh, uh, wisdom or, or, or knowledge uh, is is being mixed with the Word of God, and and they're drawing human conclusions from the Word of God, and and that's the the heresy of Gnosticism. And there were there were several different Gnostic teachers in the first century of the church. It's been like this since the beginning of the church that uh, men use their own eyes and ears to examine the Word of God, and and they mix it with philosophy and they mix it with uh, uh, mythology and and uh, they try to uh, interpret the Word of God according to human standards instead of its own standard, and. Uh, so you get a mishmash of, of, of human knowledge with a few verses thrown in, and often uh, uh, great heresies arise from, from this practice. And the Greek word Gnosticism, or, or, or the word we get Gnosticism or Gnostics, like, like I said, uh, there were specific teachers, Gnostic teachers. They pur purposely mixed the, uh, uh, a philosophy and the word of God and, and said this is... Uh, the result, you know, this is what the way the world is, and the Bible proves that too. Like uh, they would use the Word of God to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Heracles, the uh, philosopher, who said everything changes, Pantare, uh, uh, that his his philosophy was right because the Bible says uh, these things about changing and and it shows the nature of Christ in this way or that way and and it was often about the person of Christ that they had these Gnostic uh, ideas come up whether Christ was just a man, whether Christ was just God, uh, whether Christ could sin or did sin, 
Uh, all of those things are part of Gnosticism, and we see that still today. There's a, 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 a guy trying to produce a movie now about Jesus and, and him being gay and the apostles were gay and this and that and all kind of uh, crazy things where they say uh, this is the way the world is around us, so the Bible must interpret that, you know, it must say that. So they're, they're trying to make the Bible fit their ideas of what's right in the world. So uh, even though uh, there is a specific idea for and specific teachers they were probably talking about in this Gnosticism and Timothy, it's still a thing that's alive and well today. And we as Christians have to know what's the word of God and what's the wisdom of man. And we have to, you know, sometimes we can say, well, you know, that's a good idea in, in, in man's understanding of things. My, uh, like uh, just the idea of, of marriage. An unbeliever can recognize that marriage is a good thing and, and have a successful, faithful marriage for many years on earth before they, uh, uh, their lot time is ended here. Well, that's God's blessing on them and that's all they're gonna, the only blessing they're gonna get, right? Because they, if, they don't re, if they don't receive Christ, if they don't believe in Christ, then uh, uh, their eternity is going to be a grand disappointment. So I hope they at least get a good marriage out of it. Uh, but um, we have uh, the idea of Gnosticism that he's combating, and we also saw that there are people there teaching um, uh, that the Mosaic Law is the way that you should live your life to be a Christian. And uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Mosaic Law in the second class too, but there's uh, starting off 612 commandments uh, uh, that uh, uh, they're supposed to do, you know, live their whole life by. What they And then they go on with even more, and then you get into Leviticus and, and the instructions for the priesthood and worship according to Le Levitical priesthood. And, uh, uh, you know, there's thousands of rules by the time you get through all of that. And uh, so they're trying to say, you've got to follow all of these rules. You've got to be a good Jew to be a good Christian, right? And, uh, uh, and the funny thing is, we've, as we noted, that uh, they aren't necessarily that good of a Jew <laughs> to begin with. So, uh, uh, and that's so uh, he talked about Gnosticism a little bit, and then he switched over to teachers of the law in verse seven. And uh, 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 they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. And and he he says he knows the law is good. The purpose of the law is to show us that we are sinners. The law is connected to sin. The law is here to tell us that we are sinners and to show us, demonstrate to us we are sinners by giving us the, the rules that we would have to live by to not be a sinner. And everyone falls short and everyone is then indicted that they are sinful and that they have no relationship with perfect righteousness because of it and they need the work of Christ to have that perfect righteousness. Christ died to pay for those sins so that we could... Uh, uh, be imputed with the righteousness of God and have a relationship with him. And uh, uh, the uh, Paul is, is picking up here in, in verse tw uh, 12, um, uh, the gospel, the glorious uh, 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And we noted last time that glorious gospel has also been entrusted to you. And you are the guardians of the gospel wherever you are listening to the word of God today. We hope that you are uh, uh, convicted that you indeed are a guardian of the gospel. You have to remember it, keep it in your soul, and share it with others. So, um, uh, I, and picking up at 12, finally, quit babbling, get to it. Uh, 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me, given me the power, okay, or having strengthened me. He did it in the past. He did this on, uh, on the cross in the past, a lot further in the past for us than to Paul at this point in his life. But nonetheless, it happened in the past. He, he uh, provided the work and it has continued on to this, this point, that aorist active participle. It emphasizes, it, we would translate it basically as a, 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 a present perfect 
participle, okay? In, in English, that's where you get the having been strengthened in some translations as you look at it. And uh, it started in the past with the point of salvation, and it's still true today. You are being strengthened by the work of Christ in your life, that glorious gospel. Uh, because he considered me faithful and, and, and has put me into service. Because of Paul's faith, he saved him. And because of, Paul, uh, of, of, of Paul's belief, he decided to put him into, to use him to spread that glorious gospel. Now, as I said, Paul is, is, is no different from each and every one of us as having been entrusted. He just did a little better job than most of us do in spreading that gospel, okay? And, uh, but we still have that same, that same uh, uh, blessing from God putting me into service. Now in 13 uh, uh, to 17, 13 really to 16, uh, we see Paul's state uh, as an unbeliever, and we're going to see uh, uh, his position before the law, okay? And I want to take a quick trip over into the book of Acts where we see Paul for the first time in Acts chapter uh, nine. Actually, we're going to back up to a little bit before nine and eight here, and see when Paul comes on the on the scene for the first time here in Acts chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter seven. Um, uh, Acts chapter seven. Uh, we have the the St Stephen's testimony before the council, and uh, um, he did a great job of demonstrating Christ. In the Old Testament, it's a beautiful uh, statement that he makes. He did such a good job that they uh, 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 got very angry with it, at him and uh, continuing to reject the gospel. They decided that they would stone him because he was blasph a blasphemer. He was teaching that uh, uh, the Old Testament was pointing at Jesus and Jesus was the Messiah. And they did not appreciate that. Uh, let's pick it up at uh, 754. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. And uh, uh, they began gnashing their teeth at him. Gnashing the teeth is, uh, right, you're, you're angry and you want to say something, but you're not saying anything and you're just grinding down on your teeth. And, they, and uh, they're, they're fixing the, they're, they're fixing it. I'm a Texan, yeah. They're, uh, they're about to... Uh, uh, blow up on him. They're they're holding it back at this point, but they're gnashing their teeth at him and uh, cut to the marrow or in their hearts. It, it, he's pierced them. That it, the beautiful testimony that Stephen gave um, uh, just before this, and uh, it cut them to the quick, and they begin gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit. He's got his eyes on heaven, literally at this point. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he's not afraid. He's uh, that he knows full well they're they're angry and they're coming at him and that he is a uh, they're going to consider him a blasphemer and that's punishable by death right they aren't going to they aren't going to murder him in this in that sense they are about to take him out and stone him according to the law they're doing justice as far as they are concerned okay. Uh, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he, Stephen, gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he sees the, the uh, glory of God and, and, he, and, and Jesus standing right there where he said he was going to be at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And he's the only one that saw this. Nobody else could see this. This was the, the, uh, the eyes of God, the Holy Spirit, to see all the way to the throne room of God and, and, and see his... Remember, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's what we were told, right? That Christ was seated at... The Father said, Come, sit at my right hand, right? Seated at the right hand of God, we look at this, and he said, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is giving him a salute. Jesus is giving him a round of applause for, for having the boldness to speak the gospel uh, in such a manner that it's even going to cost him his life. And so when he looked into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus wasn't sitting at the right hand. He was standing at the right hand of God. 
And uh, uh, he said, Behold, the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears. Oh, believers, they cover their ears. They don't want to hear the truth. They do not want to hear the truth, though it's just been spoken to them so eloquently and, and so thoroughly in the power of God, the Holy Spirit. He's told them how Christ was the Messiah from from eternity past and all through the Old Testament and how the, every promise that God has made to Israel is fulfilled in Christ and have the, the glorious entire plan of God laid out in front of them and the majesty of Christ as promised from, from the Old Testament dying on a cross for them because they couldn't earn their own salvation and they couldn't stand to hear it. They covered their ears. And uh, that's the hardness of heart that we have in the world around us today. It's, it's, you can get in trouble just giving the gospel. Jesus loves you and he died for you. You couldn't pay for your own sins, so he did the job. All you have to do is believe in him and you get eternal life in the presence of God because of his work, not because of your own. People, we're almost to a stage in, in our society where you can, people will kill you for saying that, okay? So while you have a little bit of freedom and protection, a little bit of freedom and protection still, you need to get that gospel out there. Whoever you know, make sure they are believers or give them a chance at least to make that decision that will save them forever. So they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. Everybody in the room pushed forward and they uh, 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 grabbed him and pushed him and, and kept on going. There's a rule that says they can't kill him in the in the uh, 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 place where they're at, in the, in the walls of the city. They have to take him outside of the walls of the city to be able to stone him. And so with one move, that whole crowd gets up and starts pushing him out of the city. Uh, and when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. There's the Apostle Paul. His given name was Saul. He was named after the first king of, of Israel. And uh, Saul, uh, a young man named Saul, he didn't just happen to be walking along there, guys. He was in that crowd. He heard the witness of Stephen. He heard that testimony. He was part of that crowd that pushed Stephen out. And inst but instead of throwing rock, getting to throw rocks, I don't know if he was a, a rock thrower or if a, 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 a member of the Sanhedrin themselves could not throw rocks. I don't know if that was, it sounds like a rule they might have. But uh, uh, yeah, it, just the guy that, that tells everybody else to throw the rocks and kill the other guy, right? Um, oh, I don't, I, I can't get that blood on my hands, but you guys go ahead and stone him, okay? It's uh, the gate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, 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 his, he's got uh, guard duty on everybody's uh, uh, token Texas there. They laid down their robes at, at the feet of a, a young man named Saul, and they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he expired, breathed his last. And uh, he gave such a marvelous testimony that he got a picture he got to be a picture of Christ in his death right he said i i uh uh, uh let the let, uh, don't hold this sin against them uh, just as christ said on the cross and just as christ breathed his last and said uh so did timothy so did stephen here um uh, not part of really part of our class today, but I couldn't stop reading the story. It's so <laughs> it's so wonderful. <laughs> but uh, we pick up in uh, chapter eight, Acts chapter eight, and here we get the the background story on Saul that I was looking wanted you to uh, hear as we go into that section on Timothy. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. See, he wasn't an innocent bystander or just a cloak guard. He didn't just happen to be there and guard some cloaks. He was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. 
and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, uh, uh, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you that back in Acts chapter 2, Christ told them that the, the Spirit was going to come upon them and then go into the areas of what? Judea and Samaria, and then to all the earth, right? So how is God going to do that? This is it right here. This is how God got the gospel into Judea and Samaria. He, he let Stephen be stoned to death, and Stephen gave such a magnificent testimony that everybody was, was hot to kill more Christians, right? They said, we can't let this blasphemy com continue. We've got to stop this. And so they started, uh, they started the persecution in Jerusalem, which made every, uh, a lot of Christians leave town, go into the areas of Samaria and, Ju and Judea, and uh, uh, they didn't stop being Christians. They just went to a new town. So now you have the gospel spread because they would go and go to the syn synagogue and be in the markets and tell others about Christ, right? So uh, that's the... The cream pie uh, uh, scenario I, I often talk about. If I take a, a cream, a beautiful uh, uh, cream pie and put it in the middle of the room and slap it as hard as I can right in the big fat middle of it, you, it trying to destroy the pie so that none of you get any pride. But when I hit that pie, all of you are going to get a little bit of it, right? It's going to go, it's going to splatter, right? And and God, that's the very method God uses to spread his, his, his uh, word. He's, he allows the persecution so that we'll get up and move and go tell somebody about the gospel. So it's another another good reason to get out and spread that gospel. <laughs> you better go give somebody some pie before you get smashed. <laughs> right? So uh, uh, he, uh, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, Except the original apostles. The apostles were still there in Jerusalem. Verse 2, Acts 8, 2. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. You know, and I, I'm glad that he, he got a proper burial. And uh, that, that there, I often read that and wonder, why did they lament? What a magnificent way to go. To get to give the gospel uh, to uh, everyone around to uh, 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 and somebody had to have believed from that and uh, um, uh, to die in a manner reflected that reflected the the death of our Lord on the cross to see the glory of God right how what's to lament over that I almost wonder but they I guess I guess they were going to miss him and that's the reason only reason we lament when our our loved ones pass away because we miss them so uh, but we know that they are in the presence of the glory of God. Devout men, uh, let's see, uh, made lamentations over him in uh, chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. And he wasn't just putting them in prison. He was putting them in prison, waiting to stand trial, and if they did not uh, 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 say the right thing in that trial, they would get the same fate as Stephen did, okay? So, uh, uh, and notice, Paul began ravaging the church, okay? And then the next thing it says is, he was entering house after house, okay? A church is, is, is the body of believers, right? It's not a building. They didn't have temples for, for Jesus. They didn't have places to gather together in worship. They were worshiping in houses, and and still the persecution came for them, house to house. Hey, I heard them singing uh, a hymn over there. Here come the police. You know? That's happening in China right now, right now, this day. Chinese believers aren't, aren't allowed to build churches. They assemble in each other's homes, and uh, uh, the government is coming for them, putting them in jail, and uh, um, sending them to re-education camps, getting, trying to tell them to recant the gospel and quit telling other people about Jesus. And many of them are dying in those prisons because they would, won't, check, won't, won't, won't uh, turn on Christ. So uh, he would put them in prison. Verse four, 
And this is Saul, our Apostle Paul, that we're studying, uh, just before he changed his name. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip, 5, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began pro proclaiming Christ to them. Now, uh, uh, we saw originally the the uh, the spread out the one spread out the diaspora was was giving presenting the gospel spreading the gospel but here Philip one of the uh, one of the disciples that most of whom were still in Jerusalem teaching the word uh, he decided he was going to go make a mission trip over to uh, uh, the city of Samaria well uh, I want to skip ahead just a little bit here and. Uh, uh, move over to uh, Acts chapter 9 because we're looking at this story for Saul not, uh, uh, we'll go back to Philip some other time so we're going to skip over to Acts chapter 9 verse 1 now Saul still breathing threat and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and that's exactly the Greek word they're breathing every breath he took, he was exhaling a curse to these Christians and, and, and talking about how he could find another one to throw in jail so they could stone them, okay? This guy is seething with anger. He is uh, 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 just hell-bent on uh, destroying the church. And he had, so he went to the high priest, verse 2, Acts chapter 9, verse 2, and asked for letters from him, uh, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, um, uh, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So there's mul there are multiple synagogues in the city of Damascus, and Paul, I don't know if he had heard that, that there was uh, Christians in, in some of them or if at this point he just wanted to go and make sure there were no Chris, Christians in any of them. So he got a, a, a letter, bona fides, letter of reference from the high priest that gave him the authority to go in, into the uh, synagogue and find out who was worshiping Christ and how would he know that they were worshiping Christ? as it says here, belonging to the way. And the way is, is much akin to what we've been talking about with our walk in life, okay? This is the, a manner of living, okay? And uh, uh, just as when we walk, we walk down a road, a way, right? And uh, uh, they are known by their fruits, right? He's going to go in there and he's going to see the ones that... Uh, 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 are reading those verses he heard uh, uh, Stephen talk about. He's going to go in there and look for the, the smiley happy ones who, who are teaching that God loves everybody and, and has, has sent his son. And he's going to find them uh, one way or another that they are practicing this way of living their lives, this Christian way that we aspire to live. And uh, so he's going to find them and, and bind them and bring them back to Jerusalem to throw them in prison to be a, eventually be stoned. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And uh, verse 4, And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he he has uh, 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 the Lord has has, has shown up and uh, is is asking Paul why are you persecuting me now Paul knows that this is God he knows that this is God God doesn't tap you on the shoulder and you say who dad okay uh, God you know God makes himself known with a a, a a blinding light in this case. And Paul didn't have the eyes of God, the Holy Spirit. The glory of God is too much for us, for our mortal eyes. And it, it blinds Paul at this point. And uh, suddenly a light from heaven, and he fell to the ground. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, 
Who art thou, Lord, Adonai? He's, he's going to call him Lord, right? And that's one of the Jewish names for God. They don't say God, they say Lord, right? And uh, so he's recognizing that, that, that he has been tapped on, on the shoulder. And, he's, and uh, the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That's got to be a shocker for Saul at this point. And he says, uh, uh, why are you why are you persecuting me? I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And and Paul doesn't say, well, wait a minute, I'm after those those <laughs> those way people, right? I'm not I'm not I didn't say anything to you. <laughs> I didn't hurt you. And, but we are the body of Christ, and Christ knows us as part of Himself. And when He protects us, when He and, and when He does outreach, He's doing that recognizing that we're a part of his body, okay? And uh, uh, just as he intercedes here um, uh, on his own behalf to help his body to stop this persecutor and to glorify himself, of course, but uh, he also uh, 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 recognizes that when he hurts the church, he's hurting Jesus, okay? So, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. Paul has seen, has seen the glory of God, and it blinded him, and he heard the voice of Jesus, who he knows full well had died on a cross. And uh, he is not a believer yet. Okay? He's still Saul. He hasn't made that faith decision yet. That's why Christ tells him, go see this guy, and he's going to tell you what you must do, right? What's that thing you've got to do? And, uh, uh, and, the man, uh, and the men traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So they, they hear a sound, if not the, the, the exact words, they're hearing a sound, and, and, and they didn't see the flash of light. They don't see anyone. They don't see Jesus there before them. They just hear this voice. And Saul got up from the ground and threw his and though, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He's blind. Um, um, and so these men are leading him by the hand and they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he's with the people that he came. He was traveling with. These are people from the temple because he he couldn't go and bind and gag and drag off all these Christians in Damascus by himself, right? He had a he had a group of people with him from from the uh, council, and uh, so they they got a place to stay. And he's waiting there for three days. He was told to go and wait, and he would be told what to do. Three days, he he didn't eat anything. He's uh, um, uh, didn't drink anything, just sitting there uh, staring at nothing because he was blind. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here am I, Lord. The same answer uh, 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 Isaiah gave, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it Isaiah? Here am I, use me. No. Uh, Behold, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man named Tarsus, from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named, he's already seen, he's going he's to know you by name because he's seen you, right? He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man uh, how much and how much harm he did to thy saints at Jerusalem. If I go report to him, I'm going to get some of the same, right? And, uh, uh, and there uh, uh, in Jerusalem, verse 14, and here he has, the, uh, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon thy name. 15, and the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, a chosen vessel of mine. 
Okay, and uh, uh, again, Paul uh, Paul is going to be a, a special a, 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 an instrument of the Lord to spread that word, right? And believers, you. you you don't have to. You don't have to have Jesus tap you on the shoulder in person. Jesus has already tapped you on the shoulder if you've heard the gospel and believed it. Okay, you are a chosen vessel. You are a, 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 a king priest here in the devil's world. You have all the tools that Paul had to spread the word of God. Um, uh, bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He, uh, he, he's been out persecuting the church. By the time Paul uh, reaches the end of his life, he will know the meaning of the word suffer, right? He's going he's gonna to endure hardships. He, he, he himself will be stoned uh, at one point, possibly to death and resurrected that he can continue his journey. Uh, and uh, he's going to be imprisoned. He will indeed speak before kings, Caesar, and, and before all the magistrates uh, and, uh, uh, of Rome in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but Paul's going to fulfill all of those things Christ just said he had chosen him for. Okay? And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And... Uh, And, Paul, and Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So has Paul believed now, Brother Saul? Has he believed now? Yes, in that three days time of reflection, he became a believer, right? And and and. It never says, and Paul believed, okay? Uh, but here we have it, that he is going to receive the Holy Spirit. So we know that he's made that decision. And, and when he says, uh, uh, Jesus, who appeared to you before the, on the road here, Paul doesn't say, oh, no, it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't argue with him about it. He knows that that was Jesus. Jesus identified himself, and he believed that now, okay? And so he's become a believer in those three days, and uh, he's going to uh, be regain your sight, right? He's going to see. He, his human eyes failed him when he saw the glory of God, and now he's going to receive the, the, the eyes of God, the Holy Spirit, and, he, and that's going to be reflected in the fact that his physical eyes are going to be healed and he's going to be able to see again, though he was blind. And that's indeed the condition of his soul. He was blind. He was enraged. He was as hard of heart as anyone could be. And Christ revealed himself to him and it changed, it changed his whole life. It set him free. It made him the most devo devoted apostle that 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 Jesus ever ever had, as in, in many's opinion. Ryan was it would agree with me, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, he's uh, 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 all because he responded to the to the voice of God, and he was healed, and he was given the eyes to see through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and. Um, uh, he regained, he, and, and immediately when he, when he said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he, and he regained his sight, and he arose and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, isn't this the he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Paul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, uh, uh, remember, Paul had, was a trained uh, Pharisee, right? He had studied the Old Testament all of his life, 
And, and it was right there in front of him, right, right under his nose the whole time. And, and instead of seeing, the identifying, using that information to identify the Messiah and believing in, in Christ when he, when he was in, alive on earth, he chose to see a set of rules that he could prove he was good enough for God by. And he was locked in to that set of rules. And um, uh, it took this miraculous incident of, of, of his blinding and then Jesus tapping him on the shoulder and then the dream and Ananias comes to him and all of these things happened. And when he saw the gospel in the Old Testament that he knew so well, he immediately went out and started teaching, the, teaching others. And, and so he, he was equipped. He had all the knowledge of the Old Testament and could quote all those verses that he had heard Stephen say in, well, just before he had stoned. He knew all those places and he could uh, uh, show other, other Jews how Jesus fulfilled all of, the, all of the promises of the Messiah. Now, let's go back to 1 Timothy and we pick up at uh, 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 13. So we've got one verse on us today. Okay, we're doing good. Uh, let's see. And Paul is talking about his condition um, when, Jesus, when Christ called, called him. Considered, uh, uh, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The result of no faith is ignorance, okay? That's why the world's so stupid today. <laughs> the, when you don't believe God, you start making up things, and, you, and, and it's, it's crazy the, the standards that the world says are important these days. It's crazy that, that they can't recognize things obvious in nature, right? That's what blows me away. Um, uh, so uh, uh, he was uh, acting ignorantly and unbelief. So Christ showed him mercy. How did Christ show him mercy? Well, he died for him on a cross, certainly, just as he had died on a cross for you. But he also went a, a, a miraculous mile, extra mile, and making a, 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 an appearance to Paul in person and uh, um, uh, blinding him and then healing him, all these extra things, that's great mercy that, that Christ has shown Paul, okay? And uh, we aren't in, in the age of, of miracles like in the Old Testament. This is in the transition period between, between God, uh, Christ's uh, ascension and the church is just starting out. So we do see miracles at this time, but these days, not so much on the miracle side, right? And uh, 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 the reason is because it's to our greater glory that we believe without a miracle, okay? It's more glorifying to God that we don't have to get struck blind to see the truth of the gospel that simply God, the Holy Spirit, working in us, convicting us, has shown us our sin sinfulness and our need to have the gospel, okay? And uh, uh, so that is uh, uh, even more mercy than uh, uh, that Paul knows that he was shown great mercy. And, uh, and he says he's shown that mercy because he was acting ignorantly in unbelief. Hardened of heart. Believers, when you get hardened of heart, God is going to going to let you go, going to let you live in your ignorance, okay? It gets to that point. In the Old Testament, when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, really, it, it wasn't like he took away Pharaoh's volition. Pharaoh still had to make a volitional choice against God each and every moment of his rebellion there and not doing what God wanted. He still had free will. It was just that he was so locked in in, in, his, in this battle of will with Moses. 
whom he had known when he was a young man, right? Because Moses has been raised in, in, the royal, in the royal palace. And uh, uh, he, he was so locked in in this battle over the, over the Hebrews that he, he just couldn't turn back. He couldn't turn back, you know? It's uh, um, uh, just that pig-headedness because you decided what was right and you won't, won't change your mind, right? And uh, uh, it, it takes some pretty stern stuff to break through hardness of heart. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, is going to have to do some tremendous work in this country to, to uh, get people to the point of salvation because they're so locked in. They've lived, I mean, for, for goodness sake, if you've had surgery, thousands of dollars worth of surgery to try and change your gender, it isn't very likely that you're going to say, man, I was wrong. I, I, I have, I have, I have erred, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, but it has happened. There, I've seen testimony of people who had, had uh, even had uh, had been homosexual and even had uh, transgender operations, and finally seen the the gospel of Christ. And you know, they have a testimony of the ravages of sin on their body, and uh, uh, they try to use that for the glory of Christ. There, are, there are people out there testifying right now that uh, have, have made those big mistakes and God so blessed them, showed them such mercy that they were able to reverse that hardness of heart and, and make a decision for Christ still. So even though it's formerly a, a um, um, 15, let's see, yeah, 14, excuse me. I acted ignorantly in unbelief, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't even say found. I don't know if your Bible might have found in there in italics. It just says faith and love are in Christ Jesus. That's where, where, that's where we go to get that, that uh, love that he has demonstrated to us. We receive it just by faith and uh, uh it's all right there in Christ, faith. And it, it's the love he demonstrates here, not the love we're going to produce after we believe. Excuse me. Verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Okay. And uh, so you can believe this, a trustworthy statement. And, and, and you can fully accept it is put your faith in this statement, right? This is credible and you can believe it, right? That, and what is that statement? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, okay? Well, if Jesus is the Messiah, all of the Jews believe that Messiah is coming to uh, uh, rule from Jerusalem, rule the world from Jerusalem, right? And uh, uh, that's the, that's still to this day their belief that when we, when the Messiah comes, it's going to be for the for the kingdom of uh, 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 that he's going to sit on the throne, that he's going to lead uh, his people, God's people, to the heights that God always promised them in the Old Testament, but they would. They never were able to attain. They were never able to do what God asked of them, right? And uh, so for this, um, um, desert, he came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come into the world to be the king yet. He came to save sinners, to die on a cross for us. Um, and and uh, speaking of sinners, I am of whom, among whom I am foremost. He knows the depth of his sin before Christ. Not just the fact that he was a murderer or, or you know, killed these people. Like I said, he wasn't even murdering. He, it, and he was fulfilling the law, right? He was, he was acting legally uh, at any rate. Uh, he saw himself as, as righteous. It was his lack of faith. That's the, the degree of, of, of his sin. 
is the fact that he rejected Christ. He rejected the message of Christ. He didn't see it in the Old Testament. He only saw the, the supremacy of, of, of the Pharisees and keeping the a way of life of keeping the law. Right? And it was in it wasn't in the fact that he persecuted the church that he says, I am I'm the foremost of all. The foremost sin that he's talking about was his unbelief. Okay. Is it, 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 acting ignorantly in unbelief, right? And and like I said, that's just what we do today. When we fail, when we fail to believe the word of God, it's going to result in us acting ignorantly. Okay. Uh, and uh, I love what happens next in this book. I, it just it just blows me away that uh, uh, Paul says, uh, and yet for this reason because of his sin, I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost sinner of all time, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. When those Jews who knew he was a persecutor saw that God had forgiven him and, and that he was preaching the, the gospel of Christ, Every one of them said, if, it, if, if that guy can do it, I can do it, right? If that guy can become a, a believe, believe in Christ and follow the way, why can't I? I wasn't killing anybody. I wasn't causing, I wasn't causing fear among all the Christians, right? And uh, uh, so it's the great, magnificent grace that God has shown to Paul that uh, lets everybody know God has no limit to his forgiveness. God has no limit to his mercy. And that he was going to, uh, because of this example, he's going to demonstrate that perfect patience and show everyone that all they need to do is believe and receive eternal life. And it blow, I was telling you, this part just, just blows me away. And it blows Paul away too, because right here in the middle of the, of the letter, or the uh, middle of the, the sentence here, he drops everything and prays. <laughs> Look at verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Such a, a quick, beautiful, glorifying prayer to the king, eternal as the... Uh, 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 to the ages of the ages is the idiom that he's uh, using there in, in uh, Greek. To the ages of the ages. And then you, you see down in the next line, forever and ever. <laughs> he's, the ages before and the ages now. But it was glorified then and he's going to be glorified now. Okay, and And he gives the entire thrust of the Old and New Testaments right here in one quick two-line prayer, glorifying Christ for the magnificent mercy that he's shown to him. Okay, Now to the king eternal. King is eternal, immortal, invisible. Right? We walk by faith, not by sight. He's invisible. And uh, it's when Paul was blind that he finally saw. Right? That's when he, that's when he got it. He saw the invisible God when he was blind. Um, uh, invisible, the only God. To be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he picks up with his instruction on verse 18 and says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my child. It, some translations say son there, my son. And we've talked about this, this, this close relationship that Paul and, and, and Timothy have. That he led Timothy to the Lord. Timothy uh, wanted to follow him and has been with him ever since. And uh, uh, has, has taught him and suffered with him and traveled with him. And uh, uh, the exact word is child there, but my male child is a son. So that's not a gross mistranslation to say my son. Uh, in accordance, this command I entrust to you in accordance with the prophecy, prophecy previously made concerning you, 
that by them you may fight the good fight. And we noted in our outline that uh, when he says there, the prophecies previously made concerning you, that we, we often misunderstand that word prophecy. And we say, uh, uh, okay, there's, there's uh, you know, some priest must have come out of, of the woods with his hair on fire and, and pointed out Timothy and said, uh, you're, great, you're going to do great things. You know, we, we think of uh, these uh, grand gestures of a prophet, you know. And, and, but the Greek word prophecy just means to, to say something in advance, right? Like prediction, okay? Prediction simply means to say something in advance. It's, it only has mystical qualities because we, don't, we can't c control the future, right? When you say it's going to rain tomorrow, you're making a prediction. And you may think you have every indication that it's going to rain tomorrow, but maybe a dry day. You know, you never know because it's the future. And so they have, they have prophesied uh, about Timothy. Well, what were those prophecies? If you look over at uh, uh, 4, chapter 4, verse 14... Paul says to Timothy there, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterances and with the laying on of hands by the elders, presbytery. That's the, that's the prophecy, that the prophesying that Paul is talking about in chapter 2. Remember, we don't have to assume some grand thing according to what we might think a word means. The Bible interprets itself. All we had to do is turn one more page, and we see exactly what that prophecy was. He's referring to Timothy's ordination, right? He's, he's telling him, we've laid hands on you and, and prayed that you will spread the word of God, and that's what you've got to do. That's, what, that, that's your mission, right? Fight the good fight. Keep doing that no matter what the opposition may be. He's encouraging him because he just talked about there are Pharisees in town. There are, or, um, uh, what are they? Uh, there are uh, Gnostic teachers and philosophers. All these people in Ephesus are trying to lead his flock astray and give them bad information. And Paul is telling Timothy, you've got the correct, you've got the truth, you've got the real information, and you've got to keep giving it. You've got to tell them that message every time. You've got to tell them, encourage them that they are eternally saved in the work of Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment of, of the Old Testament. And he came, he was foretold to come and die for us. And because we simply believe in him, we have God, the Holy Spirit now, that we can see, we, we can be used to glorify God in our own lives. This is the message that he's telling him to fight for. Give it all the time. Go out there and show people that their message is not the right one because it's not the way, not what's told in the Word of God and it's not glorifying to God. Okay, um, uh, this command, I the command I tr entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies. I'm back in uh, chapter three, verse eighteen. Trying to be trying to make sure I'm giving you the right map there because I've been telling that it's hard to keep up sometimes when I don't, when if I don't say it all often. Um, this command, uh, 18, I, um, uh, accord with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now, we talked about sh uh, uh, good conscience in um, um, uh, verse 5, Tim, 1 Timothy 1, 5, uh, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. A good conscience is uh, part of our eternal salvation. As a believer, when we sin, and we recognize that sin in our life, and, and uh, we, we pray that to overcome that sin in our life, and we have our faith firmly in God the Holy Spirit to give us that result. Remember, your faith has a result, believers. If you just say, yep, I sinned, and keep sinning, then you've done nothing for the glory of Christ because you've had no result in your lives. 
Get it? You got to have a result in your life, and that's what's going to glorify God. Okay? So uh, uh, when we uh, come back to, to, because we come back to the cross, recognize that we have been forgiven, we appeal to God, the Holy Spirit, and overcome that sin in our life, then we can have a clear conscience. We're not, to, we're not told to never sin. We're told to stop sinning some, right? And, uh, and, and that's our goal is to sin less because we rely on the Spirit more. Nothing we do in the Spirit is sin, right? And uh, uh, speaking of sin, uh, we're going to, to talk a little more about that in our next hour. So we'll get a little more about uh, uh, Timothy, I'm afraid. We're, we'll be skipping around. We'll come back here to Timothy next uh, uh, Sunday in the early class. And uh, lo and behold, I'm going to make a study in Corinthians. <laughs> I love the way God the Holy Spirit does that. <laughs> so in our, in our second class, we're going to study more Timothy. And next week in Timothy, we're going to study Corinthians. So we, we get around. We get around. <laughs> we'll let, Julie will get good labels and Brian will get good labels on the video. So you'll be able to keep up. Okay. Well, let's close with a word of prayer this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father for the magnificent grace that you have shown us, the mercy that your son has given us. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the fact that you didn't, have to you didn't have to send the Lord to tap us on the shoulder. We thank you that your spirit convicted us and showed us our, our sinfulness and showed us our inability to come to you uh, without the work of Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your abundant mercy has given us the only thing we can do, and that's simply to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have full assurance of our relationship with you. Heavenly Father, we pray your spirit will work in us, work in us to glorify your son through our correct behavior. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Love that tie. <laughs> oh, thanks, sir. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Amazing.